Uh, we're in a series called Love Expressed, and we're talking about worship. Love Expressed is the definition of worship in my opinion. So I want you to turn to two passages. Turn to Isaiah 14. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 14. And then if you can, put a marker at Ezekiel chapter 28. We'll begin in Isaiah 14, and then we'll flip over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, I've, I've told you this before, um, but it just helps you to understand how I think when I'm preparing a message. I'm a, a bottom line person. Um, I, in my opinion, there are two types of people in the world, bottom line people and uh, beat around the bush people. And um, when I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm, I'm constantly wondering what the bottom line is. You know, what do you, what do you want us to say? What's the point? Sometimes I think, is there a bottom line to what you're telling me right now? Um, and uh, if you're married here, by the way, if you're um, uh, a bottom line person, then you're married to a beat around the bush person. <laughs> or vice versa. Be, two beat around the bush people would never get married because they never get around to it. But, um, <laughs> and two bottom line people would, would kill each other. So, so you, 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 that, that's the way God wired us. So I, I think this way. So years ago, I, I, was just, I just had this thought. And it's, it's just kind of a strange thought, but I just thought, what is God's bottom line? I mean, what's, what's God's bottom line? What, what's He doing? Where's He going? What's He trying to do? Why did He create us? What's, what is all this about? What, what is God's bottom line? What, what does God want? What is His desire? And then I thought it this way, what is God's greatest desire? If God has a desire, and we know by Scripture He has some desires, He desires some things, He wills some things, it's His will, His desire. What's his greatest desire? And then as I was exploring this in Scripture, I had this thought, what is Satan's greatest desire? Because that's our enemy. He's trying to stop me. He's fighting against me every day. What's his bottom line? What's his point? What's he trying to do? So next weekend, I'm going to share God's greatest desire with you. But this weekend, I want to share with you a message called Satan's greatest desire. And this will help us to understand what the warfare is about. Satan's greatest desire. Um, here, here's question number one. We're going to have three questions today, all right? Number one, what was Satan's desire? What was Satan's desire? Now, when I say was, before the fall, before he fell, when he was in heaven, we know he was in heaven before he fell as an angel, and before the world was created. Most theologians believe that the world was, was formed, but it was void, and that's because Satan had been thrown to the earth, and then God came and spoke order into the confusion. So what was Satan's desire? Isaiah 14 will tell us his desire, and I want you to, when we read this, uh, I want you to pick up on there are five uh, I will statements. Five statements Satan said, I will. But all of these statements, it's going to shock you when I tell you this before we read it, and you see it, 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 all of these statements have to do with being lifted up, or going up, being seen, being high, all right? So we're trying to figure out what his greatest desire is. Isaiah 14, uh, look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart. Okay, this, this is his, what he said in his heart. So this, these are his heart's desires, all right? Now watch here, here begin the five I will statements. I will ascend, notice the word ascend, go up, into heaven. I will ascend into heaven. Second I will statement. I will exalt, that's being lifted up, my throne, you put a throne up high, above, again up, the stars of God. Third I will statement, I will also sit on the mount, the mount is a mount, it refers to as the highest point of a mountain, the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, north is always up on the map. Fourth I will statement, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights, notice three words about up, ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then watch what he even calls the name of God he decides to use in his fifth I will statement. I will be like the most high. 
He doesn't, he doesn't even say the most holy. He says the most high. He wants to be lifted up. Now watch God's response, by the way. Verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what Satan's greatest desire is, and we have in the Scripture five statements. Remember the word will means desire. That means desire. If you say, someone says, will you come? And you say, yes, I will. You're saying, yes, I desire to come. That's, that, that's what it means. God's will is God's desire, okay? So we got five statements from Lucifer saying, this is what I, I will, this is what I desire in my heart. I want to be lifted up. I want to be high. I want to be exalted. I want to be worshiped. And then he even says it very clearly. I want to be like God. I want people to worship me. I, I want to be lifted up. I want to be seen. Now, I, I hate to tell you this, but this is actually the nature that we're born with. We, we, some theologians will say we're born with an Adamic nature, which means an, a nature like Adam's, a fallen sin nature. And that's true. That's true. But Adam was not the original sinner. Neither was Eve, by the way. Satan is the original sinner. So if you want to really be blunt about it, we weren't just born with an Adamic nature. We were born with a Satanic nature. And that nature is, look at me. I want to be seen. I want to be lifted up. I want to be exalted. I want people to worship me. I want people to pay attention to me. Before we come to Christ, the most important person in our lives is us. And, and, and we still have a, a, a residue of that in all of us. I can prove it to you. It's just a very simple question. Who is the first person you look for in a group picture? <laughs> huh? And if you don't look good, the whole picture's bad, right? That, that, that's a bad picture. Don't look at that picture. That's a bad picture. That's the way we are. And that's exactly, that's what we're born with. But when we get born again, we become like Christ, and we mature to become like Christ. And when you look at Christ, He's always turning the attention off of Himself onto the Father or onto the Holy Spirit. Constantly, every time they pay Him attention, He said, no, the Father sent me. No, I came to do the will of the Father. I say what the Father says. I do what the Father does. And when the Spirit comes, He's going to do this. He's going to do this. And you need to know that the Holy Spirit's coming. But, but here's what the Bible says, too, about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, He testifies of Jesus. He talks about Jesus, and the Father lifts up the Son. If we could listen in on one of their conversations, it would sound something like this. You're so wonderful. No, you're wonderful. No, you're wonderful. No, you're wonderful. <laughs> and the more we become like Christ, the more we don't want to focus the attention on us, but we want to focus the attention on God and others, the more we become like Christ. Satan's desire, way before, before we were even here, was to be worshipped, to be lifted up. Now, uh, we start in the verse 12, back up to verse 11. It says, your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments. Now, this is very important, and we're going to come back to it, but you need to see it in the Bible. This is talking to Lucifer. And it says that he has stringed instruments. That's very important, okay? Satan has the sound of your stringed instruments, all right? So just remember that Satan has stringed instruments, all right? Now, let me tell you something about, else about this in Isaiah 14. This was a prophecy actually given to the king of Babylon. But we know that God is addressing Lucifer. We know he's addressing Satan. But it was given to a man, but it was speaking to the spirit behind the man. Now, this is common in, in Bible language. I can give you an example of this that um, all of you will recognize. When Jesus was on this earth, he turned around and said something to a man, but was actually addressing the spirit behind the man. Do you remember that? He turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Okay, so this is normal in Scripture. The reason I want you to know that says, and by the way, if you look, verse 4 tells you that, you, Isaiah 14, 4, you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So this is spoken to the king of Babylon, but it's addressing Lucifer. Now, the reason you need to know that, turn to Ezekiel 28. Just to the right, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. You may not, might not see Lamentations. It's real small. And then Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. Here is a prophecy given to the king of Tyre. But it's very simple to see that it's talking to Lucifer, okay? Um, Ezekiel chapter 28, look at verse 11. 
Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seal of perfection. Well, that's pretty amazing to say this to a man, but it's talking to, the, to Lucifer. Watch. You are the seal, were, past tense, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, before we go on, let me just say this. Either this is talking to Lucifer or the king of Tyre was one good looking dude. <laughs> perfect in beauty. And you'll see in a moment why Lucifer was created perfect in beauty. All right? Because of his, his responsibility in heaven. Verse 13. This tells you for sure it's talking to Lucifer. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, now look at me just for a moment, all right? Um, the king of Tyre was never in Eden. As a matter of fact, there were only four persons in Eden. God, Adam, Eve, and who? Satan, Lucifer. So why would the Bible that can never be wrong say you were in Eden unless he's talking to Lucifer? You were in Eden, the garden of God. And we know the king of Tyre never entered Eden because uh, the tree of life was in Eden. And when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God drove them out of the garden and put angels there stationed, angels there with flaming swords so they could never re-enter. And this is why he said, he said, because they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we need to drive them out unless so that they don't eat from the tree of life and live forever. Now, please hear me. Uh, you, so, so many people say, now that's the judgment of God. No, it's the grace of God. Even his judgment is his grace. I hope you never forget what I'm about to tell you. Here's the reason. Because Adam and Eve were in a fallen state. If they had eaten from the tree of life in that fallen state, they would have lived forever in a fallen state. They would have lived forever separated from God. And God knew he was going to redeem them. And he said, we have to get them out so they don't eat. By the way, that tree of life, is Revelation tells us, it's in heaven and you can eat from it all you want in heaven. And God wants you to eat from the tree of life, but in a redeemed state. Not in a fallen state. You see what I'm saying? So, so when you say, well, that's the judgment of God. No, it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. And whatever you're going through right now, by the way, is the grace of God. That God will cause his grace to shine in whatever you're going through. Okay, so he drives them out. So the king of Tyre was not in Eden. Styles and formats may change over time, but the richness and hope of God's Word and its teaching always remain constant. The Blessed Life Small Group Curriculum, based on Pastor Robert's best-selling book, The Blessed Life, is now available at Passages. This dynamic, interactive curriculum can be used in a small group setting, for personal study, or even during your family devotions. To purchase the Blessed Life Small Group Curriculum or any of our other many resources, visit Passages at Frisco, NRH, or Southlake or visit us online at passages.gatewaypeople.com. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. This is why he was perfect in beauty. He was covered with precious stones. And then it lists some, the sardaz, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. I'm going to come back to that statement. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Uh, look at me just for a moment. What, what's a cherub? An angel. This isn't talking to the king of Tyre. It's talking to Lucifer, who we know by Scripture is a fallen angel. You were the anointed. You covered. You ruled in heaven. You were one of the three archangels in heaven that rule over a third of angel, third of heaven. When, when the angels fell, when Lucifer fell, a third of the angels, those under his authority, those who followed him, fell with him. Okay? You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. This wouldn't be talking about the king of Tyre. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. That's Lucifer. 
by the abundance of your trading, and I'll come back to this word trading and explain it to you from the Hebrew, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Lucifer got kicked out of heaven. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, or ruling angel, from the midst of the fiery stones. Now, go back and look at the last part of verse 13. It says, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Okay, let me explain this. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Okay, this word timbrel means a, a percussion instrument. Uh, our, our closest word to it today, what would be a close word for a timbrel? A tambourine. And sometimes this word's translated tambourines. Okay. The workmanship of your, your tambourines, your percussion instruments, listen to this, and your pipes. Do you know many times this, this is actually translated flutes in Scripture? And, and let me tell you what it means in the Hebrew. Wind instruments, your pipes, your, your instruments that you blow through to make a sound. Okay. Now combine this with, with Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 said, and the sound of your stringed instruments, your strings. And then here he says, when you were created, I created in you timbrels, percussion instruments, and wind instruments, pipes, like a pipe organ or something, wind instruments. All instruments fall into one of these three categories. Any instrument is either a stringed instrument, a stringed instrument, a percussion instrument, or a wind instrument. All instruments. All instruments. Lucifer was created with instruments in his body, in his being. Why? It's very simple. He was the worship leader in heaven. Uh, there are three archangels in the Bible. Three ruling angels. Three angels who rule or have authority. And they're named. All three are named. Gabriel, Michael, Lucifer. Now I want you to think about this. Anytime we get together in a worship service, we're going to have three components to it. We're going to have worship, we're going to have the Word, and we're going to have prayer. When you have a quiet time, you're going to have three components to your quiet time. You're going to worship, you're going to pray, and you're going to read the Word. These are three components in any worship service. Worship, prayer, and the Word. Okay. Anytime you see Gabriel, he's announcing the Word of the Lord. He brought the Word of the Lord to Mary, the mother of Jesus. He brought the Word of the Lord to Zacharias, the, the father of John the Baptist. So Gabriel brings the word of the Lord. When you see Michael, he's answering prayer. In Daniel chapter 10, when the angel's trying to get the, when an, an angel's trying to get an answer to Daniel with prayer, the ruling angel, Michael, has to come and help him, the one who rules over prayer. So you got Gabriel ruling over the word, Michael ruling over prayer, and Lucifer ruled, past tense, over worship. And then it says, you became filled with violence from within by, by your trading. The old King James uses the word merchandising. Let me tell you what this word means in the, in the Hebrew, okay? Um, if Pastor Todd uh, owns a suit store, and he's the owner of it, and I'm, I work for him, and I'm selling suits, and you come in and you want to buy a suit, and we find one for you and all, and then I tell you, okay, the suit's $300, and you give me $300, and I take $200 and put it in the cash register, and I take $100 and put it in my pocket. That's merchandising. That's what the word means right there in the Hebrew. Okay, here's what it is. Uh, you are giving me something that doesn't belong to me, but it's supposed to pass through my hands to the rightful owner. But instead, I take some for myself. That's what it is. That's the exact sin. Here's what it is. Satan is leading all of heaven in worship. And the worship is supposed to pass through him to the rightful owner. And one day, as, as he's leading heaven in worship, he said, I'll take some of that. And God said, you're out. Jesus said it this way. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven that fast. And can I tell you why? He didn't fall because God, God was insecure about him taking some of his worship. He immediately left heaven because God is the only one worthy to be worshipped. And he stole something that didn't belong to him. And his greatest desire has always been to be worshipped. Okay, so that's point number one. Here's point number two. What is, what is 
Satan's desire. What is Satan's desire? Like right now, right now, on this, or during this earthly time, we're on the earth, what's his desire? Let me read you the scripture. Matthew 4 says, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. Let's just take Jesus. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, I'm telling you that Satan's greatest desire is to be worshipped. And while he's tempting Jesus, he tries to get Jesus to worship him. You don't think that's his greatest desire? <laughs> I mean, he goes all the way to the top. He tries to get the Son of God to worship him. And it's interesting the language that he uses because he says this, if you will fall down and worship me. He doesn't just say, if you'll worship, but he says, if you'll express it. I want you to express it. Please understand, worship is always expressed. Worship is love expressed. Love is always expressed. Don't tell me you love someone if you don't express it. If you love someone, you're going to express it. If you love the Lord, you're going to express it. Now, maybe you're not um, uh, as outgoing in your expressions as someone else, but there will be some expression of it. But I have had some men before, I remember talking to a friend of mine and saying to him, you know, I don't ever see you clap or, or lift your hands or sing. You just kind of stand there, you know, in, in church. Why is that? He said, well, it's just not my personality. And then he and I went to a Cowboys game. <laughs> and a miracle happened. His personality changed right before my eyes. He clapped, he shouted, he danced. He was amazing. Listen, if you can get excited about a guy carrying a pig across a chalk line, you can get excited about by being redeemed from eternal hell to eternal heaven. And the best thing, men, the best thing you could ever do for your children is let them see you worship. You know what a lot of children think? That's a woman thing. That's what a lot of our little boys think. Mama worships, but daddy doesn't. This is a woman thing. No, they ought to see you standing there just like this, loving your God, expressing your love to Him, expressing your gratitude to Him. Listen, when you love someone, even men express it. Invite you to join us each week on The Blessed Life with Pastor Robert Morse. Experience dynamic Bible based teaching. Enjoy freedom from the inspiring worship of the Gateway Worship Team. It's a time to grow, be encouraged, and learn how to live the blessed life. The Blessed Life with Gateway Church's Robert Morris. Years ago, when I used to travel and speak in churches, many of the churches I spoke in were real small churches, and we'd have to drive, and, and uh, I was with a, a friend of mine. He and I were speaking at a church together. He's a pastor. He was a pastor then. He's still a pastor of a church. And uh, we drove to this little town, stayed in a hotel. We shared a room, you know, because it was such a small church. And uh, so we're, we're getting ready to minister. And I went into the bathroom, take my shower, and get ready for that, the service. And then I came out of the room, out of the bathroom, and he was seated on, on his bed in the room, you know, talking to his wife on the phone, and his back was facing me. He was facing away from me, so he didn't see me come out of the bathroom. Now, you have to know, this guy, six foot five, weighs 260 pounds. And here's what he was saying. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. I love you more. And then he said, get ready, baby, your man's coming home. <laughs> then he hangs up the phone, turns around, and says, get, get back in there, get back in there. He said, don't ever walk in on a man unannounced when a man's talking to his woman. <laughs> Great big guy, but he's in love. So he expresses his love. Do you know who does not want you men to express your love? Satan. Because it's his greatest desire. 
He was the worship leader. He got kicked out of heaven. His greatest desire is to stop every person on this earth from worshiping God. What was, what is, here's point number three, what will be? What will be Satan's desire? Uh, we, you know, the great thing about being a Christian is we have the end of the book. We know how it's going to turn out. Revelation 13, 4 says, so they worship the dragon. If you don't know who, who the dragon is, uh, Revelation 12, 9 says, the, so the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know who it is, it's Satan. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? Now, I don't know if the last two statements there jump out at you, uh, but they jumped out at me the very first time I ever read them. Who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? You know why that jumps out? Because that's in Exodus 15. When the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, Miriam led them in a worship song. The horse and the rider, he is thrown in the sea. And she leads all of Israel in this song. And in that song, here, there are two lines that go like this. Who is like our God? And who is able to make war with him? Who is like our God and who is able to make war with him? It's called the Song of Moses, by the way. And, uh, and, and Revelation says that we're going to sing that song in heaven. So you, you might want to uh, brush up on the words. Otherwise, you'll have to watch the screens in heaven. <laughs> Who is like our God and who is able to make war with him? And in the end times, people are singing that about Satan. Who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? Now, here's what's going to happen. Well, just, just to answer the question, <laughs> uh, let me, Revelation 17, 4 says it this way. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb but the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. So here's what's going to happen. One day Jesus is going to be sitting on His throne, and they're going to be on earth singing, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with Him? And Jesus is going to turn to Gabriel and say, What did they say? And Gabriel, he's been waiting for this day for a long time. He's going to say, They said, who's, that, who's like the beast, and who's able to make war with Him? That's what they said, Lord. <laughs> and Jesus is going to say, Gabe, that's what he calls him because they're close. <laughs> Get me my sword. Yeah. And John describes what happens next. He describes it like this. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and wage war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And he has a name written which no man knows but he himself. And the armies, and the armies clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. For he shall rule them with a rod of iron, for he treads the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and his name is King of kings and Lord of lords. That is who is able to make war with him. That's who is able to make war with him. Okay, now let me just remind you that it said that Satan, Lucifer, was covered with every precious stone. By the way, you know what precious stones do, don't you? They reflect light. Why would Lucifer have been covered with every precious stone? He was to reflect the light of God to all of heaven. He was to reflect light. Okay, here's what's so amazing. Lucifer was covered with every precious stone. When you, you, you read Revelation 21, and it says, I saw the bride the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband. Listen, the bride, listen to what John says. And it was covered, the bride was covered with every precious stone. Lucifer was created with instruments. Did you know you were created with instruments? Lucifer was, was created with strings, um, wind, and percussion instruments. Do you know you have strings in your throat? We call them chords, vocal chords. Do you know how you make those strings make a sound? Wind passes over them. <laughs> Woke some of you up, didn't I? <clears throat> <laughs> and you were created with percussion instruments. Right. Lucifer, ever covered with every precious stone, 
the bride covered with every precious stone. Lucifer had cre instruments created in his body. You have instruments created in your body. I wonder if one day a conversation like this happened after God cast Lucifer to earth. And there's all this void, and then God comes and begins straightening things up, and He speaks light, and He creates the stars, and He creates the plants and the animals and all. And then on the sixth day, He's walking on the earth, and Lucifer might have said something like to, this to him, hey, who's going to give you praise now? Who's going to give you glory now? Hey, who's your new worship leader? And God reached down and grabbed a handful of dirt, squeezed it, blew in it, and said, that is my new worship leader. That's my new worship leader right there. And furthermore, that dirt is going to crush your head. I'll show you how great I am. I'll show you my glory and power through a piece of dirt. Pretty amazing. But a problem happened. When God blew in the dirt, the dirt became living, a living soul that would live forever. And then the dirt decided to follow Satan. So God became dirt and died to redeem the living souls that He had created. And so what is Satan doing right now? He's doing everything he can to stop you from worshiping God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every week we, we do this. What's God saying to you? And every week we end our service with prayer. We want to pray for you. If you're going through a difficulty right now in any area of your life, we want to pray for you. Okay, we want to pray for you. So if you're going through a difficulty, no matter which campus you're attending or if you're in an overflow room, in just a moment, we have one more worship song. We ask that no one leave unless you have an emergency, and we understand that. But if you can, we want you to, to stand and worship God. You ought to worship God, especially after a message like this. Just engage for just one more song. But if you need prayer for any area of your life at every campus, we're going to have leaders at the front. I want you just to come to the front. Just come to one of the leaders and say, I need prayer if for your job, marriage, health, finances, whatever it is. And we let us pray for you. Don't be embarrassed because other people are going to be coming. We do this every week. Uh, it, it's not embarrassing to ask for prayer because we all need prayer. I need prayer, okay? Every person needs prayer. All of our pastors need prayer. We all need prayer. So if you need prayer for any area, you don't have to be a member of Gateway Church. If you need prayer, then you step out and come and let us pray for you. Holy Spirit. I ask you to draw every person at every campus that needs prayer right now in Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I wanna encourage you to sign up for this class because we wanna help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you. Pastor Robert's newest book, The Blessed Church, is now available. You'll learn practical wisdom for cultivating real growth by nurturing biblical health in your spiritual community. In the book, Pastor Robert unfolds how a church can be successful and healthy. Purchase your book at Passages today.